I am pleased to be here at this 40th anniversary of Master Gardeners. I have been working, well, I used to come here to NC State a lot when I was uh, early in my career. I knew all the folks here and had students here and liked to go to the Arboretum. I don't come as often now, so I kind of get lost like we have been wandering around. But I, I love Master Gardeners and I've worked with Master Gardener uh, groups all across the state. I've spoken and, and gone to their fairs and plant sales and seen their uh, st uh, gardens, their display gardens. And so here again, you've heard it so many times, but congratulations on 40 years of changing the world one plant at a time. And I hope you'll keep doing that. And I hope I'll inspire you today to learn about native plants because that's uh, something that more and more people are going to be asking about and we need to do more with native plants. So just to get, I just want to show you these pictures to get started. These are your clients. Um, you might deal with homeowners like the house on the left who doesn't have a single, uh, not, not, just not a native plant, but not even a decent plant. <laughs> Look, he has more concern for the car. It's covered up. <laughs> and then many homeowners are like the one on the right, the all-American home, neat and trim and tidy. No native plants, except for the trees, but still nice. So you've got to help both of these people and others to do what they want to do, but you've also got to bring them to a higher level, I think, to learn about what they can do to improve their, their lot, so to speak and grow more natives, and that's what we'll talk about today. First, a little background about me. I started growing natives uh, 50 years ago in graduate school, back when natives were just wildflowers. You had a little wildflower garden. And then I came to UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens in 1976 and started in their young 10-acre gardens there, uh, the Van Landingham Glen. And we grow there every kind of native plant you can grow. And in 1983, well, here's, uh, we grow things that grow together, uh, look nice. We try to have collections of things that go together. We try to have rare plants, and we try to have, try to have showy plants, and we have plants that bloom throughout the year, and all the different kinds of things you can have at a botanical gardens. Uh, you've just missed, well, you missed it a long time ago, back in March. We have about an acre of bloodroot that come into bloom. So if you're ever down our way in any time in March, stop and see the bloodroot. These bloodroots have been self-replicating there now for 40 years. And what starts as a, you know that ants carry the seeds of bloodroot. You may not know that yellow jackets also are very important seed dispersers of spring wildflower seeds. I know that you don't want to hear that because you don't go out and caress yellow jackets and you don't encourage them to your garden. But they're out there transferring seeds, especially trillium seeds, my goodness. So I worked, when working at the gardens there for 40 years, maybe even longer. I started out with the, on the crest of the wave of the native plant movement in 1983. That was the first Cullowee conference. Before then, we didn't bother, uh, uh, nobody wrote books about growing natives. They just enjoyed natives in the wild. But then, the native plant movement, grow more natives, more natives on the roadsides, more natives in your, in your gardens. Uh, the problem is, how, how do you find natives? How do you learn about natives? Because the gardening books were not about natives. So, uh, in 2012, I decided to write all that down in a book. Partly I did that because as I was getting older, I was forgetting you all don't know this yet, but as you get older, <laughs> you forget things. So I wrote it all down in the book, everything I wanted to tell everybody about native plants. And people ask me how long it took to write this book, and I say 41 years. <laughs> 40 years of learning and growing and studying and testing and observing and traveling around. And then one person year at the computer writing it all down into an intelligible uh, pattern. And of course, the folks at Timber Press and my photographer, Will Stewart, helped make it look pretty good. Uh, but I'm very proud of this book. So I have one copy. If anybody hasn't seen it, you're welcome to come up and look at it. I'll be glad to talk with you. It's available. It's getting cheaper now on Amazon.com. I think it's less than $28 you can get it. And there, it, it, I don't know why people would 
turn one in, but you can even buy used copies now. <laughs> so I like, to, uh, I like to go in the wild. I like to take people on field trips. I like to talk with folks. I've enjoyed your uh, two days here. I've been here talking with you. I, like, I do homeowner consultation. I'll be glad to talk with you about any problems you have. So that's part of, this is what you all do. You see, you all go out. You all talk to people. So I'm hoping to inspire you to come to understand natives even better so that you can impart that knowledge to the people that you work with uh, to make life better. So as you know, in home landscaping, the classic uh, elements of the home landscape, trees, uh, deciduous trees, shade trees, evergreen trees, small flowering trees, shrubs, ground covers, uh, and then sunny, plants for sunny borders and plants for woods. Uh, these are the elements of the, of the home landscape. And we're just going to talk about a few. I'm going to talk to you about some principles and show you a few uh, unusual natives uh, that I like that are uh, somewhat more uh, available. The problem with natives is they're hard to come by. Every, the big box stores don't have them. Uh, the mom and pop stores don't have them. Tra traditional places don't have them. They're becoming more common, but they're not as readily available as you might think. So it's hard for the general public to, to acquire them. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So the big question is, why use southeastern natives? That's the big question. Well, first, first question is, first answer, what is a native? And so we do not get into debates over what natives are. There are plants that are growing here on their own. How else would they be growing here naturally before Europeans? So Native Americans might have moved them around. Birds and animals might have moved them around. They might have migrated. They, they endured you know, 40,000 years of glaciation. Glaciers all left just 10,000 years ago. Uh, so during those periods, plants were moving around. So native plants are plants that were growing wild before Europeans started bringing over their plants. So that's what a native is. And Natives don't grow all uniformly across the uh, country. I think the most uniform plant across the country is big blue stem grass, which is a great prairie grass, and broom straw, broom sedge, the old field. Those are two of the most ubiquitous plants. But most plants have their own home range. They're, they're more local, they're more regional, and, and there are reasons for that. So you have to know about southeastern natives. So the first why you use southeastern natives is they're more adapted, better adapted to our heat and humidity here in the south. Those of you, many of you, many folks you're going to be talking with and homeowners have moved down here from the north. I don't know why. <laughs> Could be storms or snow or uh, they just want to have more sun, but they've moved to the south here and they've encountered the heat and humidity. This makes all the difference in the world for growing plants. If you didn't know that yet, study on that. We are in winter hardiness zone eight. By the way, that's redundant to say winter hardiness. It's just hardiness. Hardiness is, these hardiness maps show the average minimum winter temperature in a zone. And also, by the way, hardiness, the word hardiness applies to tolerance of cold. Uh, it doesn't mean an easy to grow plant. So if you want a hearty plant, easy to grow. If you want a hearty soup, you know, wonderful to eat, use the word hearty with a T. If you're talking about hardy, ability to withstand our cold winters, you use the, the word hardy with a D. So we're in zone eight, and you notice zone eight, this yellow goes all the way across the south. This is winter time now. <laughs> up into the Pacific Northwest, all the way up there, and way on up farther, they have mild winters, just like we do. Not up here, those are cold winters, but mild winters. We do not lose plants here in the south due to winters. Our winters are mild, okay? On the other hand, it's the heat that kills us. The heat zones, look at the heat zones. We're in heat zone eight. <clears throat> so there's that yellow again. This is summertime temperatures now. The hottest, the, the average heat days in the summer gives you these zones. And look where this goes. This goes west and up into the Midwest. Do you see any yellow up here in the Pacific Northwest? No. 
Where do all of our, where do many of our horticultural plants come from that are sold in big box stores? Oregon, Washington, Portland, uh, they have cool winters and cool summers. Do not buy plants from Washington and Oregon if you're going to try to grow them here in the southeast. Get plants grown in Texas or Louisiana or North Florida, uh, anywhere, but don't buy plants grown in the north. They're not adapted to our southern heat and humidity. This is a super, this is what accounts for losses of plants. People run out to the store and buy some beautiful petunias, um, plant them, and in two weeks they're, they're dead. I was at a nursery one time in Charlotte, near Charlotte, uh, uh, over uh, uh, Gastonia, I think, went to a nursery. Beautiful spring flowers out on display at the nursery. And then comes this gigantic truck, you know, twice as big as this room. And in there it was full of petunias. Lady, where do you want these petunias? So put them over here. These had been brought down on this big truck from Canada. <laughs> so if you're selling plants grown in Canada, down here in North and South Carolina, how are they going to take that uh, three zone change in temperatures? Well, get your plants from nearby. Get your plants from nearby. Don't, don't buy from far away. Second reason to use Southeastern natives, they give a sense of place uh, and, and allow you to share in our natural heritage. Plant things that look like they grew here. The highway department is trying to do this more. They've just passed a law, finally. Uh, plant more local plants along the highways. I think we need to celebrate American plants more. Just say no to Russian sage, <laughs> Russian thistle, Russian olive. Plant American. Make uh, America, <laughs> make America green again. <laughs> and I don't want to get into all that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Now, there's good reasons why many of our landscape plants come from China and Japan. It's because we have the same climate, and those plants were brought over here 200 years ago, and they've become adapted for homeowner growing. Their nurseries know how to grow them, how to treat them. They're, they're, uh, uh, they've got disease-resistant ones, and that's just been the norm. Folks have not done the same thing as much to the same degree uh, with natives. I don't even know if, oh, who can tell me one Russian plant that does grow well here, a shrub. That, that's uh, worth growing, it's not an invasive. <laughs> well, it's, it's Russian, it's the Russian arborvitae. It's the little uh, microbiota, uh, and they're pretty hard to establish here. They don't like the heat, but, but they're truly Russian. So we don't have a whole lot of truly Russian plants. The third and best and great reason to grow natives is to help feed native birds, bees, and butterflies. And this is what you're hearing more and more about. Plant things in your garden that help bring in and sustain these animals because we like them. And they're absolutely having a hard time out in nature as development takes that away their habitat. So our little, our little uh, islands of, of uh, resources for them in our gardens is really a good thing, and they help beautify the garden. And so, in order to convey these ideas to people, to convey these notions, you've got to think of a strategy yourself. You've got to have your ideas of what you're going to tell homeowners when they say, what can I plant? Don't just say, oh, let's go see what Home Depot has. By the way, many of the summer blooming perennials at Home Depot are natives. Phlox, Monarda, Liatris, Joe Pye weed, orange butterfly weed. These are all standard perennial plants, summer bloomers, and they're all native to North America. And so we're fine there, as long as you don't have some weird cultivar uh, that's been developed, like the uh, coneflower series. Uh, some of those are kind of difficult here in the South, but you, but, you, but you can try them. It's the spring wildflowers that are the most difficult, the early bloomers that are most difficult for nurseries to grow well. Uh, but that's another story. So get some ideas. Where are you going to get ideas? Well, you can go to local botanical gardens. You can go to master gardener display gardens. You can go to municipal uh, places and see plants. Just one example uh, that I'm familiar with here in Charlotte at the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens, our native terrace garden. We started this back when I began writing my book because I said, where is a garden I can go to see native plants in homeowner 
settings. And I couldn't find any places on the internet. Ironically, you master gardeners probably had dis demo gardens showing some natives, but I didn't know about them because they weren't on the internet back then. So we started this garden, and this is the way it looked after about the first year. It looks a whole lot better now. We were uh, uh, experimenting with plants. So here's just three examples. On the left, you see uh, Cor Coreopsis uh, summer sunshine. Boy, was it a big hit the first year. It just bloomed all summer. In the bottom middle, the prostrate San Andrews cross, it became a, 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 a potential a native, sun-loving ground cover, evergreen. That's a hard one to come by, a native, full sun, evergreen ground cover. If anybody can think of something that fits that bill, let me know. On the right, we experimented for the first time with Virginia pussy toes. Who would have start, sought that stupid little white leaf plant that's only about that big could ever have any impact in the garden? But you never know, so we planted some. And here's what it's done. Here's the Virginia pussy toes. We planted five little, little one-quart rooted cuttings that we started from our original plant. And within two years, it had made a bed like this out in the full sun in summer heat no water. Water kills it. You know what the two quickest ways to kill a plant are? Um, Overwatering them and underwatering them. But you have to know which is which. I think we lose more plants from overwatering. This plant comes, here you, here's where you need to know where plants come from. Puss, this pussy toes comes from the shale barrens of West Virginia, where it's well drained, hot and dry, and they've adapted to that. And nobody had ever grown them before. And so this one nursery where I bought these, we're promoting these, these little plants that she didn't know what they were going to do, but here they are. And so uh, we're hoping to make them more mainstream. So be watching for the Virginia pussy toes to invade. Uh, we wanted to do ha hardscapes for homeowners, so we built the little brick patio. Uh, it, it, it's all filled in now. This is the way it looked in, in 2012 to 2013. Uh, we wanted to show uh, foundation plants and evergreen foundation plants that are native. And we had a little bit of lawn there. You see we've got, what's that, 12 square feet of lawn. Who knows, and now some of you who've heard me speak before know this, so, so don't be too quick to blurt it out, but what's our one native lawn grass for the southeast? Native. What's our one native lawn grass? Yes? It's St. Augustine grass. St. Augustine grass is native. I should have put a picture in here. Uh, just this past spring, I saw it for the first time in the wild down on the sea islands off of the coast of Georgia. St. Augustine grass growing in the edge of a salt marsh. So if you want a native lawn now, if you want to be, if you want to be a purist and have a native lawn, along with all your other natives, you can choose St. Augustine grass. Let me say now and over and over again, I am not a purist. I mix and match natives and non-natives. I put the right plant in the right place. I try to use natives when I can, uh, and, and, and you'll see uh, some examples of that. Uh, but I'm not a purist. Natives cannot solve all landscape problems. <laughs> but they can add new choices to your palette of landscape ideas. That's why I say I'm not a purist. I mix and match try to use the best plant in the best place. We're never going to find natives like, like petunias and marigolds that bloom all summer long. You know, we're always going to have to have those. We're never not going to find natives like crepe myrtles that bloom all summer long in hot, urban, two-square-foot places in the sidewalk. I know some of you hate crepe myrtles. Don't hate crepe myrtles. Uh, just relegate them to the right place and the right use and the right way. Uh, don't murder them. Uh, if they're too big, dig them up, throw them away, and get a smaller one. Crepe myrtles have their place just like everything else does. So if you're going to work with the public, work with homeowners, bring these new ideas in, into your own mind, you need to understand and, and be creative and, and think, how are you going to tell people about natives? So you think about your own yard or your own garden. You, work, you start there and you work out, how can I introduce some new natives, how can I try some new things, where can I go to get ideas, talk among yourselves, find local people in your city. Um, 
So, so what is your yard like? Well, my, my yard is fairly small. <laughs> and so I, I don't have a whole lot of, if you went to Bryce Lane's garden the other day, his garden is pretty small. He has a lot of plants. You can, you can fit a lot of plants into a, into a garden. Here's my neighbor's yard again. It's a little run down. There are no natives. The plants he, th these are people who hate, you, you need to uh, talk to people about why they hate their plants. Why does this man hate these uh, privet, such that he has pruned them into wretched skeletons, <laughs> demoralized, underutilized, improperly facilitized. He should, if he doesn't like them, get rid of them. Why beat them up to death every year just because you have to go out there and do that? Wrong plant, wrong place, and it's what most of American landscapes look like. Uh, regardless of your income, I see more of these kinds of butchered plants uh, around homes. Uh, here's a mimosa that came up on its own. Here's some elephant ears he got as a pet. Here's some uh, 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 caladium, some zinnias. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, adequate, maybe. Now, a lot of people's homes are full of pass-along plants. Let me warn you about pass-along plants. <laughs> Here, take some of these. No, nobody gives you something that is so precious, you know, <laughs> that it's their favorite plant. Pass-along plants are plants that grow so rapidly that you get more than you need fairly quickly. And they're not un unattractive. There's nothing unattractive about swamp sunflower or, or uh, um, uh, those things. Uh, these, these, <laughs> uh, these, uh, these blue mist flowers and these irises and these, and these uh, yuccas. There's nothing wrong with mandinas and all those things that people give you, uh, ditch lilies. It's just that they become so common, we get used to them. Uh, these are natives. These, these sunflowers are native. The mist flower is native. So just because something is native doesn't mean it's fabulous. You've got you to use it properly. So watch out for pass-along plants. So here's some new trends, okay? Let's get away from pass-along plants. Start converting your lawn into little natural areas. Do it a little bit at a time if you're afraid, if you're not sure. Tell your, tell your uh, advisees, uh, start small, just do a little bit, and then do a little bit more, and then do a little bit more. And I like lawn. Lawn is a nice, nice to walk on a lawn. Uh, not too much. So convert some lawn into natural area. Make raised beds if you live somewhere where the soil is bad. Here's another important thing. In Mecklenburg County, you can very easily have red clay. Just like in some other counties, you can have pure sand or other ungrowable. You can have muck and marl and rocks. And so you've got to improvise, create raised beds of different kinds, put in good soil of the right kind. And this is the kind of things you all will do. Uh, plant plants, not too far apart, not too close together. This is what that same bed looks like three years later. It's got a different uh, border. Uh, people change their minds. Uh, so choose plants and, and help with uh, traditional landscaping techniques. It's just try to use natives if you can. Be aware of shade versus sun. When you go to a nursery, if you worked at a nursery, what's the first question? Somebody comes in and says, I want a plant for my yard. Well, what do you ask them? To, what color stamens do you want it to have? Or, <laughs> Uh, 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 you ask them things like, what do you want to use it for? And especially shade or sun, because you can't change that unless a tree falls down. You've got to plant plants in the shade or the sun according to their needs. So, so be aware of those kinds of things, and studying natives helps you do that, uh, because natives uh, you know, you know, live locally here, and you can go out and, and, and see how they behave, or you can read about them. Here's that all-American home again with the specimen plant, the accent plant, foundation. See, the computer has uh, spaced out my words a little bit. <laughs> Trees. <laughs> so, fortunately, fortunately, most trees in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood are natives. You have to go out of your way to get a foreign tree. So most trees are native, whether you plant them or not. Not a lot of people are rushing out to plant shade trees. They take dozens of years to grow, but they're, they're important, as we will see. But these are the plants you have control over. Every one of these plants has been pruned, pruned or mowed, and that's a lot of work. And so uh, 
uh, when, you, when you choose plants, whether they're native or not, choose plants you don't have to prune so much as you choose. And here's a, a person who took, took the notion to heart, plant native, and they planted all native grasses. <laughs> to, to me, this is scary. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to, how to live there with all native grasses. <laughs> and so, don't go overboard. That's the message. Don't go overboard. Try a little, try a lot, experiment, see what you can come up with. This is my favorite picture of all time, I think. It's a, every single plant in this picture is native. This was taken down at the coast. These are coastal plants. There's a, let's see, I have to keep turning around. There's a, a live oak tree with, with resurrection ferns. You got ostrich ferns, royal, not ostrich ferns, uh, cinnamon fern. Uh, royal fern, uh, th this is southern shield fern, lots of ferns, trilliums, mountain laurel, uh, a needle palm, a Florida anis. Uh, we're not talking just about North Carolina plants, but, but southeastern plants. You, you can mix and match. Uh, you don't have to stick with things just in your state. But every plant here is native. There's no pruning, so there's no everyday maintenance. I got to admit, there's no flowers. So if you wanted to have some, some flowers blooming all summer, you'd need to find some natives that would do that. And there are some. There are some. They're just not beds of them. And so that, that's part of the challenge. And, 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 then, and then a kind of a compromise. This is a pretty dull picture. Dull house, <laughs> dull plants. But they show natives. So, so New York fern fits in here. And it mixes in with, there's a Harry Lauder's walking stick. That's not native. Here's a broadlebush buckeye. It's fitted in with some, some spireas. They're not native. Here's an oak leaf hydrangea. It's fitted in with a, I don't know if that's a purple leaf plum. Uh, here's a sweet shrub. It's, it's native. And it's fitted in with some other. So you've got a mixture of natives and non-natives. I'm not a purist. What, what things that work, the native plants are seasonal, just like the non-native plants are seasonal. Uh, Non-natives and natives are almost the same in terms of their utility, but try to work in more natives. That's, what I'm, that's all I'm saying. Try to, try to know and grow more natives. So why use natives? Here's a, a landscape, it's very ordinary, nothing stands out. Not a single native plant here. Holly, sage, daylily, salvia, crab apple. Uh, it's an ordinary, you know, kind of a weedy lawn. It's probably green all year. Why use natives? Here's the real reason to use natives, and it's the birds, to feed baby birds. Uh, you need trees that harbor caterpillars that feed baby birds. If you haven't read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, you should. If you're within two hours of ever going to hear Doug Tallamy speak, you should. Uh, you should hear him twice. You should hear him talk about uh, the fact that these native trees harbor hundreds of species of caterpillars. You should hear him talk about how many thousands of caterpillars these poor little hard-working birds have to catch every day to feed their little mouths in their nest. All you have to do is walk over to the cafeteria and plop down and eat 17 meals a day with no work. <laughs> Think about those birds. They need those trees. They need native shrubs. They need native trees to harbor the caterpillars. Look, oaks harbor 534 different species of caterpillars. The single uh, black cherry, our native black cherry, 456 species of caterpillars. You don't see them, but they're out there, and the birds are out there getting those caterpillars. So we need those trees. We should abhor the cutting down of forests to build new uh, neighborhoods in which are planted non-native uh, landscape plants. We're ruining the lives of birds. Similarly, similarly, birds collect caterpillars off of wildflowers. Who thought the wretched goldenrod that everybody fears? harbored so many caterpillars. Uh, if you're going to grow goldenrods in your yard, they're great. Just don't plant the creeping ones. Plant the crumping one, clumping ones. My favorite goldenrod is um, Solidago rigida. Makes a big clump of thick green leaves and a, a robust stalk in late summer and doesn't spread. Asters, sunflowers, Joe Pye weed, honeysuckle, black-eyed Susan, iris milkweeds, phlox, and even cardinal flower harbor caterpillars that birds eat. But you say, I don't want my plants all eaten up with caterpillars. Well, well, you have to, you have, you have, I, uh, here's a, where a moth ate some of my shirt. You've got to 
put up with a little bit of damage in order to have a lot of joy. So let the caterpillars eat some of your plants, okay? Just for the birds. Now, what about, we talked about birds, what about bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds? They gotta eat too. So, what do you think about them? Well, native bees don't care where they get their nectar. The native sneezeweed is just fine. The non-native uh, zinnia is just fine. Adult bees don't care where they get their nectar. It's sugar water with vitamins and minerals in it, and it's all pretty good. Some's better than others. Uh, they don't care. They go out into a, this is a pretty nice pollinator garden. We heard about pollinator gardens yesterday versus meadow gardens. A pollinator garden is an organized meadow garden where you purposely planted some things in an array that bloom over a sequence of time and give you a, 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 a diversity of flowers to attract a uh, wide uh, array of pollinators. So there you go, you can plant one of these uh, out in the sun and the bees make their choices. Butterflies, on the other hand, butterflies will visit any flower they can. They're pretty good. They don't care where their nectar comes from. But the caterpillars, the caterpillars have to eat specific host plants. That's the rub, the caterpillars. So if you want butterflies, you've got to have caterpillars. The caterpillars have to eat specific plants, almost always natives or very close relatives of natives. So it's all about the caterpillars. And you know the life cycle. Here's a monarch. Oh, it starts with an egg and that hatches into a caterpillar. Caterpillars are feeding machines. They're like the leaves of a plant. They feed. Uh, plants do it photosynthesis. Caterpillars eat the leaves and they grow. They pupate. They turn into a, a butterfly. A butterfly is like a flower of a plant. It's the sexual reproduction stage. And so you've got to have both of these stages in the life cycle. And so you've got to have your garden uh, adapted for both of them. Butterflies will visit any f monarch is on a daylily. Uh, who thought daylilies were so attractive to monarchs? Daylilies are actually butterfly pollinated flowers. That's what they're designed to be. But where do monarch caterpillars have to feed? Milkweeds. They can only eat milkweeds. I didn't put the word milkweed here. In your mind, write milkweed here. Because <laughs> monarch caterpillars, and if everybody doesn't know this yet, psst, psst, tell your neighbor, monarch caterpillars only eat milkweeds, and that's all they eat is milkweeds. Milkweeds and only milkweeds. So if you don't have any milkweeds in your yard, you won't have any caterpillars in your yard, and the butterflies will have to go somewhere else to eat. All right? Uh, plant more larval host plants and they almost always must be native for the butterflies. And you can go example after example after example of this, and I'll show you some as we go through. So we're now gonna go through some of my favorite plants. Some big trees, some small trees, some shrubs, some meadow wildflowers, and some woodland. That's shade loving and sun loving. And these are just ideas. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get your own ideas as you, as you learn what works in your uh, neighborhood. You all are special because you span the whole state from the mountains to the seashore practically. Uh, what can you grow in your little piece of North Carolina? I can guarantee you something on every site. Our native sugar maple grow to be pretty big trees, beautiful in the fall. Look at all these leaves. Where do these leaves go? Where? No, they get sucked up by the city and taken to Compost Central. <laughs> Why did that tree drop those leaves? That's next spring's food. Where's that tree going to get next year's food if those leaves are sucked up and taken down to Compost Central so that you can go spread them on around your tomato plants? Leave the leaves. That's my new mantra. I just thought of it. <laughs> you have heard, whew, you've heard that for the first time. That's what Bryce Lane said yesterday in making a good presentation. Tell your audience you're the first people to hear that. <laughs> so leave the leaves. Southern sugar maple, these are, the kind of, these are the ways I think. Southern sugar maple is a better choice here in the southeast because they, they come from the southeast. They're southeast adapted to the heat. Northern sugar maple, which is what you buy at the garden center, well, yeah, they grow in the southeast too, but mostly they're northeastern. And guess where the nurseries are that grow the plants that are sent to the garden center? They're probably in Minnesota. <laughs> so 
try to get southern sugar maples. And even better, here's something you don't know, chalk maple, our native chalk maple, Acer leucodermi, that means white bark, chalk maple. Look where it grows, it's strictly southeastern. Yes, these are difficult to come by. You can't buy them at garden centers, you have to go to a, I don't know, a university plant sale, or go down to Cure Nursery down in Pittsburgh when they have sales, or, or at different institutions when they have sales, and try to get a chalk maple, or mail order one. Red maple, red maples are native, and I'm not against uh, cultivars, because often, often they are better than, than the wild species. Uh, if you've ever grown a wild red maple, they're wretched, they're terrible. They're all, ugh, they grow like this, they don't have any form. Why do people grow them? They're cheap. <laughs> don't be cheap, pay more, keep the nursery industry strong. Buy those cultivars that somebody had to develop. You'll get a better plant and it'll last in the long run better and you won't end up with river birches that shed too early and silver maples that, well let me tell you about silver maples. Silver maples are not southeastern plants. They were brought here years, they're northern plants. They're grown here, they're planted in people's yards because they grow fast and they're hmm, cheap. <laughs> and so developer plant creates a neighborhood plops two sugar, uh, silver maples in the front yard. They don't even look alike, silver maples. They do have 2% of beauty, <laughs> okay? When the wind blows, the underside of the leaves are, are white, it's so nice. So I can guarantee you that in 50 years here in the south, after you plant a silver maple, you'll be doing that to it. And I don't care if you have a red fire hydrant in your front yard. <laughs> You're gonna be cutting down a silver maple within about 50 years, because I've driven through these neighborhoods. They are not long-lived plants. Analogously, sycamores, beautiful native plants here in the south, beautiful. They're planted all over the place. They grow fast. They're just about our second fastest growing tree. Who, who knows what our fastest growing native tree is? Tulip poplar. You don't plant one of those either. They get too big. Sycamores grow too fast. And where do sycamores grow in the wild? Of course, floodplains. Floodplains are wet most of the time. Sycamores do not like it dry. When they get dry, they, they, they do this. They, their leaves die early and they shed their leaves and their limbs break off and they grow too fast and people don't like them after a while because they're ugly in the late summer. So don't plant a, a sycamore. Now I know you're gonna tell me I've seen some beautiful sycamores. Yes, you have. Beautiful sycamores can be found in the right place. Uh, in fact, uh, here's some beautiful sycamores. The problem is, I wouldn't want to live there because it probably floods periodically. <laughs> if a sycamore is doing well, it's got a source of water, and usually that's flooding. Plants can tell you a lot about the environment, the soil, and you should pay attention to what plants are trying to tell you, and carry some of that knowledge over into your landscaping uh, uh, decisions. Uh, Southern magnolia, no finer tree characteristic of the south. Boy, are they messy. When you walk through the, the uh, tunnel outside of this building, all the leaves that are shed from, from southern sugar maples this time of year. And of course, um, all of my neighbors' sugar maple leaves blow over into my yard. So I have to go around and pick up these dried leaves. But they're beautiful trees, beautiful foliage, beautiful flowers, they smell good. Don't do these kinds of things. Don't plant a, a crummy, scrappy, seedling, no count, broken down, <laughs> southern sugar maple. Don't plant one where you're gonna have to prune it under a power line and look at it all year. Make some, just because you've got a native doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. Do the right thing and have a native. Plant good ones, plant selections. D.D. D. Blanchard, uh, Bracken's Brown Beauty, uh, there are others. Uh, if you don't have a big yard, plant a small one. Plant a teddy bear. Plant a alta. These are practically columnar. So look for these kinds of natives. Use them in the right place in your yard and get improvement from them. If you want to be even better, choose our southern big leaf magnolia. Uh, was first discovered just west of Charlotte, west in, uh, see who's here from, we've got some folks here from Gaston, Lincoln, Catawba, Iredell counties. That's where the big leaf magnolia was first discovered, 
1795. Big leaf magnolias had the largest leaf in the temperate zone, up to 40 inches. The largest flower in the temperate zone. Uh, big turkey dinner plate size, not just a dinner plate, but something you can put a turkey on. And you can grow these things in your garden. They're very adaptable, very adaptable to the heat. They, love, they don't mind the heat. They can take the sun. They'd rather be in the shade. They grow three feet a year. They grow well in the garden. They take up space. They're a conversation piece. This is a 45-year-old one. It's handsome. I, I sort of detract from it. I was only... <laughs> but look at this. They're beautiful fruits in the fall. Birds love those orange berries. The fall color is so-so. Can't say that it's a knockout fall color. But it's not bad. The leaves are fun to play with. In the fall, when they come down, you don't rake them, you gather them. <laughs> and some people just leave them out to look like so much laundry hanging out on the bushes to dry. <laughs> so I highly, ran, highly recommend Big Leaf Magnolia for your woodland garden as a, as a novelty, as a local plant, as a historical plant, as a world-famous plant, as a biggest of its kind, you know, it's 10 good reasons to plant. And they're available commercially. There's your uh, black cherry. Beautiful spring flowers, beautiful summer berries. The birds love them. Uh, they ripen in midsummer. Birds get drunk eating these cherries. They flop around on the ground. Cat just sits there watching. <laughs> they harbor 456 species of caterpillars. They feed the birds, they feed the bees, they're great plants. However, they get black knot fungus and they harbor tent caterpillars. Who wants that in their yard? On the other hand, they're one of the food plants of the cecropia moth. So that's good. So you got good and bad, good and bad. They make terrible specimens as they get older. They grow into wretched forms. There, there's no pretty ones. So that you should have them on the back part of it. Here's the, here's the secret. Let the lady down the street plant one <laughs> and she can supply the neighborhood. You don't have to have one in your yard. But you get you and, and your birds and bees get the benefit from it. That's why I've disguised this lady's picture so that no one will recognize her. There's, there's, her, there's her black cherry tree. So you shouldn't have a stigma against owning a black cherry tree. They're so useful. <clears throat> Sweet gum, the plant we love to hate. It has the finest, I would argue, the finest fall color. No tree has a finer fall color than black than sweet gum. Look how they, they grow beautifully. These are in an arboretum setting, fall color. They even come as columnar. You can get variegated ones. You can get weeping ones. You can get them to do all kinds of different things. The fall color is outstanding, but it's the sweet gum balls. Nobody has made an effective fruitless sweet gum. It's the sweet gum balls. And uh, people hate those. Don't walk around barefoot. On the other hand, they're the food plant of the luna moth caterpillar. So you can't go cutting all the sweet gums down. Oh, but you've got the sweet gum balls to contend with. So rather than worrying about sweet gum, look for creative ways to utilize them. Don't curse them. Look for ways to use them. What can you do with sweet gum balls? <laughs> All right, you collect them and you put them around your pansies in the fall and it keeps the bunnies from walking over and eating the pansies. <laughs> Didn't think about that, did you? It'll also keep your grandkids busy. Give you a nickel for a bucket of sweet gum balls. Oh, I'll go do that. <laughs> Don't forget little birds in the winter Rely on the seed. The seeds are not shed until February. See, you didn't know that. You thought they all came down in the fall like everything else. But the seeds are shed during the dead of winter, and then the sweet gum balls fall in February as well. Uh, so be aware of that use. And the greatest use of all would be collect the balls, <laughs> spray them, paint them, dip them, package them up, send them to China as Christmas tree ornaments. <laughs> and help balance our trade. So there you go, we got plenty of sweet gum balls. This is something you can do in the winter time in your back home, your master gardeners, and your home demo people can get together and paint sweet gum balls. 
<laughs> okay, small flowering trees. What's the most perfect small flowering tree? It would have four seasons of interest. Flowers, form, bark, fall color, colorful berries, vigor, longevity. What is that tree? Dogwood. Flowering dogwood. There's only one, world famous, our native flowering dogwood. It has all those traits. Flowers, form, fruits, and foliage. Birds love them. They're, uh, invent, they're made for migrating birds. They ripen just as the birds are migrating. And, and there's lots of uh, fat and protein in those fruits for migrating birds. But there are other small trees too. Red bud. Look at that red bud up there. Uh, and all the things you've done to red buds. Uh, we haven't done so many cultivars on flowering dogwood, but just think of red buds. You've got this weeping red one called Ruby Falls. We've got um, ones with uh, funny sh arranged leaves we call rising sun. I love that plant. We got white ones, two or three f uh, forms of white ones. We've got an all green weeping one called traveler. Some of these were uh, developed right here at the Ralston Arboretum. So red bud is a very diverse native tree that can uh, compete with any foreign uh, tree in form, shape. And in addition, you can collect the flowers and put them in a salad. They're red bud flowers along with violet flowers. And they're nutritious, edible, tasty, local, brave, clean, reverent. Like Boy Scout, that's Boy Scout, I promise. <laughs> All right, pawpaw, a little native tree. Not enough people grow it. There's its famous spring flowers, late winter. There's its big fat fruits, like a little potatoes, big leaves. They make a handsome a landscape tree if they're in the right place. Don't put them too close to the house. Uh, the fruits ripen if you have several different ones that can cross pollinate. Uh, these fruits ripen in late summer. They only last a few days. They taste like a tropical custard. You can make things out of them, ice creams and custards and desserts. You can freeze them. Lots of things you can do with pawpaw fruits. The fall color is unmatched for its beauty and yellow. And in addition to all that, they are the sole food plant, larval host plant, for the zebra swallowtail butterfly. There's the caterpillar. It's all green. It hides under the leaves. Nobody wants to look at caterpillars. But you want to look at the butterflies, so if you want to see more zebra swallowtails, plant more pawpaws. Native azaleas. We know uh, the, the, the evergreen azaleas from Japan. They've been around for a long, long time, but not very many people are tuned in yet to native azaleas, our native deciduous azaleas. Or as uh, one of my uh, mentors when I first came to UNCC, uh, Bonnie Cohn, who was the founder of UNCC, she said, come out, I want to show you my deciduous azaleas. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to correct her, uh, but deciduous azaleas. Deciduous means they drop their leaves, all right? And look, there's a butterfly. So they attract insects beautifully. They grow well with other uh, plants. This is an array of native azaleas. There's 16 different species. They bloom from late March to uh, on into August. Uh, different colors, and they do just great. They have good fall color. They can take shade or light sun. Huh, I just noticed for the first time in this pond, there's some pitcher plant flowers. I'm always looking at the azaleas. Pitcher plant flowers. We're not going to talk about those. Here's a Florida flame azalea. It's the first to bloom in late March around here, early April. They come in uh, different shades of yellow and orange. The uh, coastal azalea, you all know out on the coast, blooms in April, early April. Very fragrant, tracks butterflies, runs a little bit, works well with hybrids. And then uh, uh, lo and behold, in the middle of July, you've got the plum leaf azalea. It comes from Callaway Gardens, Georgia, down halfway down Georgia, Alabama way. Uh, excellent plants, get big, bloom beautifully, attract butterflies, hummingbirds, give you something to look at in the midsummer who says natives can't be attractive uh, even under harsh conditions. Uh, for spring, red buckeye, a small shrub. When you grow it in the sun, you get lots of blooms. These blooms are uh, early. They come out in late March or early April. They're the, one of the first plants to greet the migrating hummingbirds. Uh, they're designed for hummingbirds. Things that are red and tubular and they're not fragrant are hummingbird plants. And then they turn into these beautiful seeds, the buckeye seeds. You know, pollination only takes like all forms of, let's see, I, what can I say in an already audience like this? Y'all are old enough. <laughs> you know, sexual intercourse doesn't take very long. 
<laughs> it's the raising of the babies that take a long time. <laughs> and so flowers, flowers don't last very long, but raising the babies, the mother plant has to put all these resources into making these seeds. And so you should appreciate those too. So in the fall, when the seeds ripen, collect them, put them in a bowl, put them on the table with some nuts and things. I, 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 uh, enjoy the beautiful, like polished wood uh, of the buckeye seeds. They're also fun to take and throw at football games. <laughs> <laughs> now, whoever invented a deciduous hollies ought to be recalled for re education. Hollies are the biggest problem in the, lands in the native landscape industry. Here's a winter berry holly covered with berries. This is the most important factor of the holly, is a mockingbird. Uh, so two things about hollies. The first one is if you want to keep the berries on your holly, because the other birds are going to come eat them, you need a male mockingbird to come and adopt your tree and keep the other birds away. <laughs> Put a little sign out in front of the house, <laughs> wanted, resident male mockingbird, seasonal work. The mockingbird will eat one or two berries a day and he'll chase the other birds away. Otherwise, these are often gone by Christmas. Then what good are they? The ones that do last into the, do you, you know what this white stuff is? Some of you, some of you sons may have not seen this in a, in a, <coughs> uh, since uh, Reagan was president. It's called schnee, uh, snow. See, I, I've forgotten how you spell it. This white stuff comes in the wintertime and is beautiful and sometimes it hangs on the plants and makes beautiful winter scenes. But in order to have that scene, you've got to have those berries. So how do you get the berries? Well, here's, here's the bad news. You have to have both female plants that are going to make the berries and males that pollinate them. And the males and the females have to bloom at the same time. The males have stamens. People ask me, how do I know which are males and which are females? Well, the males have yellow stamens. The yellow stuff is pollen. You don't want to get that stuff on you. The females don't have stamens. Uh, they just have an ovary. But they've got to bloom at the same time. And how do you get that to happen? Well, you have to know something. You have to know that if you're growing the cultivar uh, winter red, that's a cultivar name, you need southern gentleman as the male pollinator. It blooms at the same time. If you're growing the, the female called red sprite, they have the largest berries on a dwarf four-foot plant, you need the male called Jim Dandy, and so forth. And whichever female cultivar you're growing, you need the appropriate matched male, because they bloom at different times, early, middle, and late. And guess how many nurserymen can tell you which males go with which females? I hope there are no nurserymen in the audience. <laughs> but nurserymen need to know what those are so they can match them up for their customers. So you get their. So my holly doesn't have berries. Well, you either have only one plant, it could be either male or female, or you could have a male and a female that aren't compatible, that aren't blooming at the same time. Well, how do I solve that? Well, you got to go sex your plants and see what time. How do you do that? Well, I charge $30 an hour for sexing hollies. <laughs> so I'll come over and look at, your, look at your hollies and see what sex you have and recommend the right one. So be aware of that. Uh, there are a lot of plants that come in separate sexes, but none are more problematic than hollies because people want those red berries. You've got to have the right male. Now the, now the birds don't care. This blue jay is just as proud of his non-native crab apples. And that many, many birds will eat um, English hollies and Chinese hollies and Japanese holly berries. They don't care about natives uh, in that sense. So this is just a reminder. It's not what the adults eat. It's what the juveniles, whether it's a caterpillar or a baby bird, they have to have native plants to get their food. Okay. So last two sections, some sunny wildflowers. Here's, a, here's a po that pollinator garden again. And look at all the different forms and colors and and beautiful things. Here's a list, you need to memorize this, of the main pollinator flowers. And I have not worked out a mnemonic, so you just have to remember Baptisia, butterfly weed, tall phlox, coneflower, stokes, aster, liatris, black-eyed susan, joe pie weed, asters, and goldenrods. 
Those are the plants you have to know. And there's your little, that's your first list of plants. Um, they bloom at different times. These are more or less in order of blooming, not, not hard and fast. And, and they give you your, your summer flowers, usually in full sun. I was uh, at a client's house one day looking at her garden, and along comes her uh, contracted uh, uh, mow, blow, and go guy who was going to do some cleaning up. And I said to him, he worked at a local nursery, this is a great place for some baptisias. Nice full sun, plenty of, you know, baptisias each need about four, uh, four foot circle to grow. Uh, they look great, it would take up space, it would shade out weeds, have, uh, you know, all that. And he says, what's a baptisia? So I knew then, this was several years ago, I knew then that the average knowledgeable person doesn't know some of the things they should know. There's where you all come in. The more you, everybody that you can teach what a baptisia is, you have improved the world. <laughs> because they'll go out and buy a baptisia now, whether they know it or not, whether they know why or not. You can talk people into buying things. Just look at TV ads. <laughs> okay, just tell them one good trait of a baptisia, and it's sold. And, and who can uh, not like orange butterfly weed and the things they do for... What, what's that guy looking at? <laughs> I think it's Amazon.com with a drone. <laughs> That's the first time I've said that, too. <laughs> look how big these things get. Look, 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 look. So you plant them and you just let them grow. And if the uh, caterpillars come and eat them all up, what do you do? Go out and trim them off halfway, they'll grow out again. So you can get the spring crop of caterpillars and a fall crop of caterpillars on the same orange butterfly weed. And these things come in red, orange, and yellow, but orange is the most common. Cone flowers. Cone flowers are from the far west prairies where it doesn't rain much. They don't like our red clay soil. Down here in the coast, you've got sandy soil, and so they can handle it better. They, don't, they, act as print of, they act as annuals back in Mecklenburg County, but maybe they're better for you down here. And one little secret, of, it's not a secret, leave the flowers up after they bloom for the birds to get the seeds, and leave the stems up as long as you can stand it, because insects eat those stems. Uh, so leave them up as long as you can. Things go on out in the garden. No finer plant than Stokes Aster. It comes from the Gulf Coast, and yet it's hardy all the way up into here and even, and even further north. They bloom in June. They're out there blooming right now. They have the biggest flowers, most beautiful leaves. They're evergreen. They're drought tolerant, but they like it wet. They grow in pitcher plant bogs. The first one I ever saw, I was standing in a pitcher plant bog. One hand was holding a poison sumac, and the other one was looking at the Stokes Aster. Ah! So you've got to be careful. Scarlet sage, it's a native annual from North Florida. It grows great up here as an annual. It comes back, it reseeds, uh, reseeds. Uh, that is, uh, it drops seed and they come back. Hummingbirds and butterflies love them. Uh, uh, bumblebees, not so much, because bees don't see red very well. But hummingbirds and butterflies do. So here's your ever-blooming summer bedding plant that's native. Uh, scarlet sage. And these come in several cultivars. Joe pie weed. You've got a coastal Joe pie weed. Joe pie weeds are thought of as tall, impressive, overpowering plants. You, you might have, a, you know, you might want one of the bigger ones for your backyard garden feature. You might have a water feature in your backyard. <laughs> these things can grow up to 10 feet tall and, and, uh, and look really great. Most people don't have that big a space. And so, we now have smaller versions, one called Gateway. It's, I think it's only four to four and a half feet. That's what I grow. And then there's now Little Joe. Joe pie weeds are butterfly magnets. I have a clump out in my front yard. When it gets covered like this, if I wanted to bring one of those branches in, which sometimes I do, I cut it, I walk over to the door. Just as I go in, I shake the butterflies off because I don't want them in the house. Uh, they're stuck on there with super glue, I guess. They're butterfly magnets. Nothing seems to be better than a Joe Pye weed. Flocks, they're hard to beat. They come in so many different colors. Here's where I talk about nativars versus cultivars. Tall garden flocks have been bred for, for decades, especially in Europe. They come in so many different fabulous forms and textures and colors, but few of them are natural. This is the natural color, a kind of a lavender. 
I'm, and I'm not a purist, I like some other things, but if you want things more like the wild, choose what we call a native R. A native R is a native plant that's brought into cultivation with only one slight change, you know, only one trait has changed. It could be a phlox that's white. And that's the only difference between it and the wild. It would be a native R. It's native, a native cultivar. It's only changed a little bit. The red monarda called Jacob Klein, it only has one trait different from the wild. That is, it's more resistant to powdery mildew. What a great thing. Uh, and, and so on. Uh, the, the wisteria called Amethyst Falls, it, it, it's, it's no different than wild ones. It's got a cultivar name. It's, it's no different from the wild ones except it was easier to propagate, and so that's the one that got propagated. Okay, so, so some cultivars are perfectly good and safe and not, and not controversial. Other cultivars might be things that are highly bred. Uh, they still behave like normal in the garden. So seek out those particularly disease resistant. And of all the flocks, the one you really should try if you haven't is Gina, J-E-A-N-A. -E it blooms all summer and was rated the highest of all in powdery mildew resistance. No powdery mildew. Not a bit. Not one. <laughs> Black-eyed Susans, everybody knows these. They spread slowly, give you a big patch. They're beautiful. Birds like them. They can take a little bit of shade, mostly sun. I would recommend you try it's a slight alternative, the sweet Black-eyed Susan or sweet coneflower. Uh, Rudbeckia subtomentosa. They don't spread. They make a clump. Clump might get a little bigger. They get taller. They bloom just as long, six weeks. Drought tolerant, heat tolerant. Butterflies love them. So here's some examples of some maybe some new things. How do you find these? Might be difficult if your local garden center doesn't have them. Tell people to be patient. Tell them to mail order. Uh, start a, a, a local plant sale yourselves. Each one of your groups, it's not a lot of work, just ask some people here. Have a plant sale. <laughs> bring, in, bring in some of these cultivars, grow them yourself for, for a few uh, weeks uh, and sell them, make them available and, and see if you can get enough volunteers together to help you have those sales. You'll be making money for yourselves and making native plants available to the public. There come, we come back to the pass along plants. All these things I've shown are, are, are better alternatives than, than some of the pass-alongs if you don't want to put up with their spreading ability, such as oxide daisy is better than the swamp sunflower. It doesn't get as tall, but it blooms all summer and doesn't spread. So there's an example of a substitute. Along comes fall, October, you get asters. I skipped goldenrod, you notice. Jump right to asters. Aromatic aster makes a big, beautiful mound like this in October. The late butterflies love it. It's beautiful in your garden. Takes up space. It's the last thing of the year. Uh, I like these two cultivars. Radon's favorite. Li a little, uh, I, I can't describe the difference in colors. So that's Radon's favorite and this is October Skies. I tend more towards October Skies, but they're both. They make big plants. If you don't want them, if you don't have a hillside for them to occupy, tie them up on a trellis. They do just fine there as well. Cut them back, make them smaller, try them. And, and then the, the greatest of all is the last aster to bloom in the year, and that's the Georgia aster. Uh, this is an endangered species in North Carolina, or it used to be, maybe it's not anymore. So you have to get one from Georgia in order to be legal. Uh, but, but look how tall they get. That's a post light. That's not one of these lights along your sidewalk. That's a regular five foot high post light. So these get as big as a post light, have two inch flowers, and bloom for a long time at the end of the season. So Georgia Aster. So my last little section here is on some shade plants. And the spring wildflowers, uh, you know, trilliums, heucheras, Virginia bluebells, you name them, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, this is not all natives. I mix and match my spring wildflowers. Uh, your bloodroot comes earliest. It fits in among other things. It spreads readily from seed. You can either have one or you can have a, a drift, <laughs> depending on how much space you have and what kind of plants you plant. Know your clumpers from your creepers. Don't plant uh, that and this with, with trilliums and, and other things that are solitary. 
So May apple is a, a creeper, it takes over. This is the creeping foam flower, beautiful, but they have to be on their own. So understand your plants, your clumpers and your creepers. Just like people, some people are loners and some are gregarious. You mix them together and it might not work. Uh, don't want to talk about that, but you get the point. <laughs> Clumpers and creepers in the garden, you got to know what you're mixing and matching. I, I love uh, bleeding heart. These will, these will bloom all summer if you keep them watered. Shooting stars are all over with. Uh, trilliums have died down. Heuchras come in different colors. I don't particularly like the gaudy colors. I've had this one for 10 years. That's called pistache. Mixed in with Japanese ferns. Huh and uh, little orange flags and other things you didn't notice. <laughs> There's a, a wire for holding up something and twin leaf. So you can have an eclectic, that's a good word, eclectic garden of spring wildflowers that blooms for two or three months in the spring. Helps you get through the a fernery. Uh, that's a word you don't hear. I've resurrected the concept of the fernery. It's a garden of ferns pretty straightforward. The ferns give you structure. They last all year. You put the wildflowers in with them. They come and go, but the ferns are there all year. And, so, and there's a, at least a dozen great native ferns. There again, you've got to know your clumpers and your creepers. Uh, a good ground cover, green and gold for shade, native green and gold. Could be in bloom any day of the year, though mostly spring. Allegheny spurge, very underutilized uh, plant. Uh, one of our best native ground covers, hard to come by, but uh, grows well in the heat of the south. They, they grow all the way from mid-Tennessee down to Louisiana, and so they're southern plants. These are last year's leaves, and this went, these bloom in March. These are the flowers. You don't really grow them for the flowers, you grow them for the leaves, and they make a nice patch. So here's a patch on a hillside of Allegheny spurs that chokes out other, other plants. <laughs> it didn't choke out that trillium, did it? Uh, but it's really good for keeping out other plants, so you don't, you don't mix it with other plants. Uh, you give it its own hillside. Uh, blue, blue woodland phlox, a great blast of color in the spring. They come in white, light blue, dark blue, easy to propagate, an evergreen ground cover even after they bloom. They grow underneath other things, so they can mix in a little bit. Understand your plants that you're recommending. Easy to grow, easy to get, easy to share. Bleeding heart, uh, easy, to, easy to grow, easy to share, easy to get. Uh, they make seeds and the seedlings come up and you can share those. And it's fun to watch bumblebees pollinate these. So I guess the most famous wildflower of all for, for light shade or light sun is cardinal flower. So I recommend you plant a big patch in your front yard where you can sit out and watch it in the summer. So I have this big patch just, just in front of our house where I sit in a chair. Um, drink, I don't drink mint juleps, but I, I drink things out there. <laughs> and one day I was sitting there and this hummingbird came up and visited and he saw me there and he said, hey, gardener, I want to talk to you. We appreciate you planting this uh, cardinal flower here. Thank you. And he said, uh, I got a message for you to take to your fellow gardeners. He said, we kind of like it that you put out bird feeders for hummingbirds and fill them with sugar water. And we all go there and fight over it. But you know, uh, that's not so good because that's only sugar water. What we would rather have is native flowers, coral honeysuckle, columbine, scarlet sage, <coughs> buckeye, you know, all through the season there's an array of hummingbird flowers, uh, trumpet vine, cross vine, any flower that's tubular, red, with a little yellow throat often. You say, when we drink the nectar from these, which we have to have for fuel, and we eat insects, but we drink nectar for fuel, we get more than just sugar water, we get proteins and vitamins from these. And all we're getting from your bird feeders is sugar water. So if you're not careful, it won't be long before we're all running around as little Come on, you all be running around little fat, hum <laughs> little, little, little fat hummingbirds bouncing off the window. So plant more natives. We know you want to see us up there in the window, but plant more natives for us to get quality food. This is just fast food for hummingbirds. 
And after he told me that, he flew away. So I'm, I'm passing on this message from the hummingbirds, <laughs> plant more natives through the year, through the whole year. Nothing is better than this uh, Spigelia, uh, Spigelia marylandia, Indian pink. Blooms for weeks, beautiful red, yellow flower, hummingbird flower. Makes a great patch in light shade. Look at that. When it's in full bloom, it's a showstopper. When it finishes blooming, you cut everything halfway down, grows back out, blooms again. And they're in bloom, full bloom right now, this time of year, in uh, North Carolina gardens. The last picture, trillium. Everybody loves trilliums. Hard to get. Easy to grow once you get them. I don't recommend the big white trilliums for the south here. Those are all northern. If you live in the mountains, yes. But here in the Piedmont and in the coast, the big, the big famous trillium grandiflorums are not good, are not good plants. Uh, better to get the su more southern bent trillium, trillium flexipes. Just as pretty, almost. Heat tolerant. <coughs> Early to bloom, a trillium cuneatum, a little sweet Betsy, fruity smell, comes up in March. Beautiful, variegated leaves. Uh, they spread, they form big clumps. Uh, great spring wildflower. And one of my favorite trilliums, the Chattahoochee trillium from down Georgia way. <laughs> look, at, look at the patterns on those leaves. Forty shades of gr green. And, and They'll mesmerize, they've mesmerized that cat. <laughs> Sit there and look at these patterns. The pattern is there to confuse insects, so the insect can't see where to, where to eat. But they're great garden plants because of those patterns. So there you go. And so these ideas you can get, you can read in books, of course, and talk to people, visit. Uh, I've tried to have botanical gardens from every so you got Charlotte and Asheville and Highlands and Chapel Hill and Raleigh and Duke and uh, 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 um, Brunswick County and, and Wilmington. I love the Brunswick County, uh, uh, New Hanover County, uh, Fayetteville, some local nurseries. Go to those nurseries and see plants. Go out, uh, visit your gardens, visit Master Gardener. And, and maybe even this encouraged some of you to enhance your master gardener gardens, your display gardens. Put in more natives, label them as natives, talk about natives, encourage people to think about natives. And then the last thing, uh, you can encourage you or your clients to join Native Plant Society. Go out on field trips. They have plant sales. They have symposia. Uh, and finally, you and your clients, go out and buy something new for your garden. It'll make you feel good. So go to plant sales, go wherever you can to get natives, support the people who grow natives, and make your gardens better. Thank you very much for your attention.